This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our series, A Survey of the Old Testament. And we'll be looking at the book of Lamentations. Now before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege and the time and the health and the freedom, everything you've given us so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Purpose. The book of Lamentations commemorates the destruction of Jerusalem by the armies of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. The poems are a testimony to divine justice and the call for repentance to God's people. Major themes, human suffering, divine abandonment, God's presence. God's presence in the book of Lamentations is expressed in a negative way by being absent or by divine abandonment. The poet writes of how God has rejected and abandoned Judah including her king, priest, and sanctuary, 2627. Ezekiel had witnessed the departure of the glory from the temple in Jerusalem because of their covenant violations. You see that in Ezekiel 9, 9 and 10, 18 through 19. Ezekiel 9, 9, 10, 18 through 19. Let's talk about the book. Lamentations gets its title from the Latin Vulgate. Its placement in the canon comes from the influence of the Septuagint. You should be familiar with that now, often abbreviated by the Roman uh, numerals LXX, meaning the 70, which in the title verse ascribes the poetry to Jeremiah, though this is inaccurate. So what I'm saying is the Septuagint gives the title of the book, Lamentations. However, in that title that they've added, they say that Jeremiah wrote it, and that's inaccurate. That's not from the original. The Hebrew title is, as I have here, Eka, meaning how, from the first word of chapters 1, 2, and 4. Sometimes this word's translated alas. It was commonly used in the opening line of Israelite funeral dirges. So the Hebrew name of this book of Lamentations is how. An example is David's lament over Jonathan's death. How have the mighty fallen? 2 Samuel 1.19 Lamentations is in the third part of the Hebrew canon, the writings. It is the third of five scrolls comprising what is called the Megaloth, or festival scrolls. The Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and, and Esther are included in the Megaloth, which was used on specified Jewish feast days. Lamentations was assigned to be read annually on the ninth day of Ab, the day of mourning for the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem, which occurred in 587 B.C. at the hands of the Babylonians, that's our Day in context, day in the context we have now, and then again later by the Romans in A.D. 70. The entire book is poetic in form. It's writing. We do not have enough evidence to assign the authorship with certainty to Jeremiah, though we do have a statement in Second Chronicles 35:25 that says Jeremiah composed laments for Josiah. It never fits, it neither fits the time or occasion of the events in this book. In other words, that doesn't apply to the book of Lamentations. That's a different set of laments. It had to be written by an eyewitness of the fall of Jerusalem, but since no name is given, it is best to assign the authorship to someone unknown. We just don't know. The time of writing it estimated between the fall of the city in 587-86 BC and the exiled king Jehoiachin's release from prison in Babylon. 
around 562. So what we're saying is it had to be written sometime around 587 and before 562. This last point is because there's no indication in the last chapter of the author being aware, being aware of his release from prison. If it had been, if he had been aware of his release, we would expect something about the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecies for the covenant restoration in Israel that is anticipated in the new covenant. Now, this is a little complicated, but basically what it's saying, had it mentioned his release, then he'd have probably said something about the new covenant. So we're accepting the scholarly consensus, as I understand it, somewhere between 587 to 562. The background, well, that's obvious. It's well known to us by now. It's the destruction of Jerusalem. is the background and its aftermath. The biblical accounts of the fall of Jerusalem are recorded in 2 Kings 24 through 25 and 2 Chronicles 36. Let's look at the second part of, well, it's about the second part of uh, 2 Chronicles 36, 15, where it talks about the fall. Let's just read through this. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. That would be the temple, the sanctuary. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. In other words, they've gone too far. He brought up against them the king of the Babylonians, who killed their young men with the sword in the sanctuary and did not spare young men or young women, the elderly or the infirm. God gave them all into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. This is all from the NIV 11, by the way. He carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God, both large and small, and the treasures of the Lord's temple, and the treasures of the king and his officials. They set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. He carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his successors until the kingdom of Persia came to power. That pretty much sums it up. In the meantime, you might say, back in the land, verse 21, the land enjoyed its Sabbath rest. All the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. So this is the declaration to start sending people back to Judah. You can go on and read that if you want. For two centuries, the prophets of Judah had warned of coming to catastrophe if the nation did not turn back towards God in obedience to the covenant. Let's look at some scripture on that. 2 Kings 21, 12. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I'm going to bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. That's a way of saying it's going to be pretty bad. 24.3 Surely these things happen to Judah according to the Lord's commands in order to remove them from his presence because of the sins of Manasseh and all he had done. Manasseh was one of many bad kings. He was one of the final bad ones. With lack of response to the warnings came a dullness in hearing, which further hardened them towards repentance. In addition, because of the delay of judgment, they developed a false sense of security. So as a judgment was put off and God gave them time, um, time to repent, time for some of them to turn back to God and the covenant, many developed a false sense of security. It's like saying, well, nothing's happened yet. I guess it's going to be okay. 6.13, Jeremiah 6.13, from the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain, prophets and priests alike. 
all practice deceit. Notice, all practice deceit. You can't find an honest person. It was so bad in Judah. They dressed the wound of my people as though it were not serious. This is what the prophets and priests do. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. I think it's interesting because it wasn't long ago that in the United States, now this is 2020 April, this is when I'm doing this recording, people were talking about peace and prosperity. And then this virus hit. And we still don't know where this is going to go. Lamentation speaks of a time when Yahweh would become like an enemy to Israel. In other words, it's going to be so bad, it's going to appear like the Lord is their enemy. Listen to this. Lamentations 2.2 Without pity, the Lord has swallowed up all the dwellings of Jacob. In his wrath, he has torn down the strongholds of daughter Judah. By the way, those Jacob always refers to Israel. That's another name for Israel and the strongholds of Judah. That's what's left of Israel, the southern kingdom. He has brought her kingdom and its princess down to the ground in dishonor. Lamentations 2.5 The Lord is like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all her palaces and destroyed her strongholds. He has multiplied mourning and lamentation for daughter Judah. The purpose and message. One of the advantages I know of me putting this up on the screen is you can turn down my, my voice, that might be a blessing, and just read along yourself. Of course, you don't hear some of my side comments like I'm doing right now. And sometimes those might be helpful, but that's up to you. Purpose and message. Lamentation speaks of the suffering surrounding the fall of Jerusalem because of the nation's turn from the covenant. It expresses to the Hebrew mind what was unthinkable and abhorrent, the loss of the temple and the city. Even worse is the divine abandonment that came to Mount Zion, the sacred mountain upon which Jerusalem and the temple were built. So, worse than losing the city and the temple is divine abandonment. Let's talk about Mount Zion. Zion, a favorite expression for Jerusalem in the Psalms, Isaiah, and Lamentations, is the Hebrew Zion. Zion here, which may mean fortified tower, which makes sense. It was up on a, uh, a small mountain, you might say, difficult to climb, steep valleys on some sides. Though the destruction and shock of losing the city and temple were clearly devastating to the people, it should not have been a surprise because of their years and years of warning for disobeying the covenant. There was no comfort in coming under the divine discipline of the hand of God. Lamentations records the day of the Lord for Judah. We've talked about that a lot. Played out under the mighty hand and terrible fury of God. The threat that came with warning became a reality. All the way back to Moses, they had been taught that God would not tolerate their level of disobedience. They were placing in jeopardy their very presence in the land provided to them by God. The curses of the covenant became their experience. Punishment had come for their transgressions. God's patience came to an end and justice fell. Now they had to look for mercy and hope. Let's read from the law. Listen to this from Leviticus 18, 24 through 30. Do not defy yourselves in any of these ways, because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my decrees and my laws, 
the native born and foreigners residing among you must not do any of these detestable things for all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you and the land became defiled and if you defile the land it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you everyone who does any of these detestable things such persons must cut off must be cut off from the people, their people. Keep my requirements and do not follow any of the detestable customs that were practiced before you came and do not defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. In other words, the word was clear. They were not to practice those pagan practices that were done by the people like the Canaanites in that land. Many of them were very gross, but these pagan practices were forbidden for God's holy people. If they allowed this to continue, they too would be, well, as it says, vomited out of the land. A very, a very um, what should I say, picturesque way of saying they're going to get booted out. The only consolation for the daughter of Zion, in other, word, in other words, for uh, the people of Judah now, is that the nations would also drink from the cup of God's wrath one day. So many of the nations also are going to come under discipline. For example, Edom. Lamentations 4, 21 and 22. Rejoice and be glad, daughter Edom. You will live in the land of Uz. But to you also the cup will be passed and you'll be drunk and stripped naked. So they better enjoy it now because it's going to go down. They're going to go down. They're going to be punished. Verse 22, your punishment will end, daughter Zion. He will not prolong your exile. So there's the end of Judas. But he will punish your sin, daughter Edom, and expose your wickedness. So Edom's going to get theirs too. At funeral dirges, the poems of Lamentations offered a type of purging or catharsis for the survivors of Judah's disaster. The sorrow and emotional expressions could not give answers to the how or why questions of why God sovereignly worked in this way. But it did allow the Hebrews to honestly deal with their grief and mitigate their suffering of Yahweh's abandonment. In his writings, the poet exposed the soul of the people, admitting her failures and transgressions and their rebellion against God. So the Lamentations does mention what they did wrong and exposes their failures, admits their transgressions while they're going through these laments. In fact, there's this one section, here it is, Zion like a widow. She's described as a widow without a man or children, says that they deserve suffering and judgment for their rebellion. That's in 118. What was needed was repentance and confession, which would add meaning to the hope in chapter 3. God's wrath on Israel was in actuality an act of love towards them as a loving father disciplining his child to wait on his mercy and still hope. So as they waited, 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 suffering, lamenting, there was still hope. Lamentations 3, 21 through 23. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. These are some of the words of that hymn, Great is Your Faithfulness. Structure and Organization Lamentations is composed of five poems. Three are funeral dirges opening with the usual wail of how, chapters 1, 2, and 4. The other two poems are in the form of a lamentation or complaint. Chapter 3 is an individual lament, and chapter 5 is a community lament. The lamentation or complaint is different in both form and content. 
The lamentation is an expression of grief over a catastrophe that is irreversible. The complaint is an appeal to a merciful God for divine intervention in a desperate situation. Four of the five poems are alphabetic acrostics. Now, we learned about acrostics earlier in our introductory lessons. Each line in succession introducing one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, this is rather technical. The purpose of the alphabetic acrostics in Lamentations is, one, to give a menomic Menomonic, I can say that today, value where the poet preserves the memory of Jerusalem's tragedy through the recitation of the alphabet. Two, to convey the full expression of lamentation over Zion's destruction, affecting catharsis from A to Z. As you go through it from A to Z, it's basically the emotions are coming out and you're cleaning your emotions out. Three, in constricting the range of artistic expression, which enables the poet to devote full attention to the topic or theme at hand. Though the concluding poem is not an acrostic, nevertheless, it follows the 22-verse pattern of poems 1, 2, and 4. That's kind of interesting, probably a matter of style. Poem 1 as a funeral dirge personifying the city of Jerusalem, once a proud and dignified woman as it's described, as it's pictured, now abandoned by treacherous friends and ruthlessly raped. The image is intensified by the use of the words and phrases like widow and queen, 1-1, daughter of Zion, 1-6. The poem emphasizes the loneliness desolation, and sense of abandonment felt by survivors of the disaster. There are some references. Poem 2 describes the intensity of God's anger against Zion. Poem 4 describes the aftermath of Yahweh's judgment. The only comfort the daughter of Zion has is the knowledge that her punishment for her sins is accomplished. In other words, they're going to be done. It'll be paid at that earthly level, you might say. The poem of chapter 3 is most developed and and thereby the longest of the book. This poem serves as the theological and literary center of the composition. The poet's complaint is from his own suffering, which represents the nation, a prayer of consolation, hope. Let's look at the references. The wondrous represents the nation, 3, 1 through 20. A prayer of consolation and hope, 321 through 29. A plea for repentance and a return to Yahweh, 340 through 54. And a cry for vindication and vengeance, 355 through 66. Major themes, obviously, one is human suffering. Human suffering is inevitable in all kinds of ways because of the fall of humanity in Genesis 3. It is basic to everyone's nature to reject God and do evil, Psalm 14, 1-4. Since these manifestations of corruption and sin are inevitable, God's justice and wrath must fall upon mankind. The basic reason there is wrath the wrath of God is because there's sin. The guilt cannot go unpunished with a perfect and holy God in complete supervision. He's not going to let it, anyone get away with it. Even though he is also long-suffering, Nahum 1.3. Much of human suffering is inexplicable, just as God's ways are unsearchable. Isaiah 55.8-11. God has uh, uh, always, his always justifiable reasons. He has reasons for doing everything he does. However, the scriptures, the scripture does explain some causes of human suffering. Now let's look at it from the standpoint of, in fact, we've studied a lot of these passages already, from the standpoint of the Old Testament scriptures. 
Eight points on human suffering from wisdom. Now the references are all NIV 11. This is an interesting category, uh, one that the author of the book um, I suggested uses. Retributive, just punishment from sin. Job 4, 7 through 9, 8, 20, 22, 8. Let's look at 22, 8, 22, 9. Whoever sows injustice reaps calamity, and the rod they weld or wield in fury will be broken. The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. So this basically says people get what they deserve. You sow what you weep, that type of principle. Of course, this carries over into the New Testament as well. Same way with the second point, disciplinary, flexion for correction, Deuteronomy 8.3, Proverbs 3.11-12, through 12, which is also quoted in the New Testament. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father of the son he delights in. You love your children, you'll discipline them. You will train them to control that sin nature. And then when they become believers, they have the additional Holy Spirit as a restrainer and also inner power to direct their life. Add to that learning the word and you're giving them the best start possible. Probationary, interesting category. God testing the heart. Let's look at Deuteronomy 8.2. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way into the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart whether or not you keep his commands. Isn't it interesting that once they became a nation, they went under testing to see what they're made of? Oh yeah, they'd been slaves. Uh, generation after generation, but once they come out and have some freedom, how are they going to use that freedom in relation to the Lord? Are they going to be trusting? Are they going to be obedient? And if you know the story, they didn't do well at all. So when they finally got the law from Moses, Mount Sinai, which wasn't that much longer, well, what was the first thing Moses had to face when he came down off the mountain? They were in rebellion. And we see this continuously from the time they left Egypt throughout the life of Israel. Many people don't know that because they haven't read the Old Testament and know that Israel, for the largest part of its history, was in rebellion, even though it had all those advantages. They had the prophets, they had the temple, they had the presence of God. They had the covenant. They were his people. He was their God. And yet they continued in their heart to be in rebellion. They had their up and down periods, but you look at their history. Ten other tribes broke off in rebellion. They were destroyed, leaving Judah. It goes into rebellion. It comes back in part. Never was the same. And they never were as obedient as they could have been, even today. Comparative. Number four, comparative testing of one with the good or bad fortune of others. Just listen to this. There's some references, Job 5, 18, 8, 20 through 20. Remember the background of Job and how we're supposed to look at Job. But let's look at some of Psalm 73. Uh, this is a test to see other people who are wicked, aren't doing things right, who cheat, who take advantage. They uh, run over people and so on and they continue to prosper. Psalm 73, 1. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. Here's why. 
For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice, with arrogance. They threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Notice it. Their mouths lay claim to heaven. They say, oh, we're going to heaven. We're good we're good religious people. We believe in God. And their tongues take possession of the earth. They control much of this world. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. People love them. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? See, this is what they're really thinking. This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Folks, that is a form of suffering for you. It hurts. It hurts to see the wicked prosper. You work so hard, you do the right thing, you even say you're a good Christian. And you may be all those things. But God doesn't let you prosper on this earth like those people. And you have to be careful because that can become a form of bitterness. Let's continue on because now it shifts. That's why I kind of made the break here in the Psalm, Psalm 73, 13. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocent. Notice how, how he uh, basically describes himself. In vain. What's the point of doing all this? All day long I've been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. If he was like them, if he acted like these prosperous wicked, it would have been a betrayal. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Look at verse 17. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. You see, it's a lack of understanding, and we've talked about this in recent studies. It's in the mystery and the mind of God and his justice. His justice will deal with these people, and it's in his wisdom that he is doing and allowing what's going on now with the wicked and the righteous. And as we just saw in the previous points, believers are tested and tested and tested. And you're standing around saying, I'm tired of all these tests. But you see, God is building your faith so you can be ready for what comes next. And you keep passing these tests and then you step into eternity and you find out not only did you pass, you passed real well. And there is reward stacked up for you. What about all those wicked who prospered on earth? Not only do they get nothing, they're not even there. But they're punished for eternity. The fifth category here is inevitable as a result of the fall. We can see some overlap here in these points. Let's look at Psalm 14, 1 through 4. The fool says in his heart there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all these evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. They never call on the Lord. So basically, everyone is born into sin. There's not a tendency to seek God. You're living off your sin nature. You have to go against, basically, well, let me put it this way. You choose against your nature. Your sin nature brings you to a point of frustration, 
and you realize there's nothing here at this end, going this way of life, there must be something else, and that's when you start seeking God. Another category is the unknowable. Oh, there's a lot of suffering that's unknowable. We learned this from Job and Ecclesiastes. The answer is lost in the wisdom and justice of God. Let's look at Job 11:7. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? We don't know why. All we should understand, in fact, let me put it this way, what we need to understand, God is perfectly fair. Perfectly fair. Every injustice you suffered, every shortcoming, every shortchanging, every wrong that's been towards you, you worked hard, you didn't get your reward, it was handed to someone else who didn't even do it. God will straighten all those things out. Do you believe that? You see, there's your test. This is what you need to do. You need to believe that. Don't think you're going to understand the mysteries of God. Some things are meant to be kept unknown to us as Christians. Uh, I think this first line is appropriate here. Who could fathom them anyway? You could understand them anyway. Okay, next category, haphazard. Now this is apparently they appear haphazard, but they're always in God's plan. But that's why I put in apparently. Meaningless in time and chance. They just come along out of nowhere. Suffering comes from no apparent reason. Job 21, 23 through 26. One person dies in full vigor completely secure and at ease. You see? Well, he was as healthy as I saw him yesterday. He was out running on the track. He died. Well nourished in body, bones rich with marrow. So you see there, there, there's the loss of life to a person who seems like what well, never happened to him, not at that point in his life, but it does. 2125, another dies in bitterness of soul, never having enjoyed anything good. Side by side they lay in the dust and worms cover them both. Death is the great equalizer. Vicarious, one suffers for another, or many. Deuteronomy 4.21 The Lord was angry with me. Now this is actually, what I'm doing here is putting... Uh, what happened historically back in Deuteronomy, and then a psalm that reflects on it. And this is when Moses stepped in for the people of Israel. Deuteronomy 4.21, The Lord was angry with me because of you, of Israel, and he solemnly swore that I would not cross the Jordan and enter the good land the Lord your God is giving you as your inheritance. Moses wasn't perfect either. Psalm 106.23, So he said he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to keep his wrath from destroying them. So Moses vicariously stepped in, and he ended up dying for it. Another interesting theme in this book is divine abandonment. After Jerusalem was destroyed, the poet lamented that Yahweh had spurned, rejected, and abandoned Judah. Not only Judah, but its king, its priest, and the temple of the sanctuary, 2, 6 through 7. Let's scroll this on up. The motive of the deity leaving the temple has been found in other places in Mesopotamia dating back to Sumerian times. So all I'm pointing out is as we look at other ancient Near Eastern literature, and we do this sometimes to, you might say, to color in um, a little bit more and, and understand what was going on. It wasn't unusual. Remember, they had their temples and their deities and their priests and their kings, just like Judah. In those writings, the deity leaves either because the city is destroyed or is impotent about changing the situation. Now that's the secular pagan perspective. 
why their deity would leave. But you see, we have in the story of Israel where God leaves also in, in a sense. The Spirit leaves the temple. He leaves the temple. But let's look at the reason. But Yahweh's abandonment of his temple in the city of Jerusalem was because of Judah's transgressions and not the impotence of Yahweh. Among the Hebrews, God willfully chose to remove his glory from the temple in Jerusalem because of the idolatry and sin of Israel and Judah. Now let me make clear a little bit <clears throat> so, not, so you won't be confused. God's glory was manifested Well, let me put it this way. He manifested his presence by his glory. And it was manifested in the pillar of fire at night and the cloud in the daytime which set over the tabernacle then later the temple. But it would leave the temple before the temple was destroyed. Ezekiel describes that. Ezekiel's, um, let's see, that's our next book, isn't it? In the pagan record, the deity's abandonment brought about confession of sin and pleading for deity's return. Now notice, in the pagan record, when the deity abandoned them, they would confess their sin and plead for the deity to return. Now that's the pagan world. But in Judah's history, now listen to this, once Yahweh's glory departed, rather than prayer and repentance, the people use it as an excuse for sin and rebellion against Yahweh. They never did turn back. That's what I meant, or that's part of what I meant a while ago when I was talking about how Israel was on a path of rebellion and their history, throughout their history. Knowing this, the poet petitioned Yahweh. So, the one who wrote Lamentations, at the end of his uh, series of poems, end of his book, the poet petitioned Yahweh at the end of his funeral dirge to once again look upon the people and return to them, to restore them as in the days of old, apart from utter rejection. If he wasn't going to utterly reject them forever, then he should restore them. Well, by now you see, and I, I hope you've, uh, it's been impressed upon you, the presence of God among the Israelites. Well, it came, it was there, it was ignored. And as they continued to reject the covenant, and remember they went through a history of their nation splitting, now they're down to a remnant in Judah. And now they're going to be taken captive for the most part and taken over to Babylon. But before that happens, the glory departs. Actually, before the temple's destroyed, the glory departs. Picturing God's presence is no longer with them. And it never comes back. Well, not in that form. The next time you see God come to the temple is Jesus Christ. And then he has to clean it up. Well, there's many more things to look forward to in these books. This one was a little shorter than average. We expect that from a book with only five chapters. But that's it. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you again for your word and the insight that this background has given us to better understanding of the book of Lamentations. Challenge us both from the positive things and the negative things we see in the life of Israel, that we will always be positive in every way towards you and doing the right thing in obedience, that we might be blessed, that we might have a life of service, faithful service until we enter into eternity. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.